be sensory sensory mimesis is inseparable from emotional mimesis and an effective piece of written fiction can thus produce an empathetic investment in entirely invented personalities and their fates. Indeed, the imagined image can achieve greater vivacity, to use Elaine Scarry's term, than the perceived image. The sea described for me in a strong fictional context, let's say by Virginia Woolf or Colette, may strike me with an intensity at once sensory and emotional that is greater than when I actually stand on the shore and look out at the ocean. And a fictional character may, in some cases, move me more deeply than a person encountered in real life. So to move on to the second section, what kinds of narrative technique achieve this magical feat of conferring what Elaine Scarry calls solidity, vivacity and dimensionality on an imaginary world? As I've argued elsewhere, and looking back, I can see it's a running theme right throughout everything, that, nearly everything that I've written. The now widely undervalued techniques of realism are central to immersive reading and continue to animate the majority of widely read fiction. The word realism is of course semantically slippery, but here drawing on a useful discussion of the concept by Marie Law Ryan, I mean, the realism that creates a credible, seemingly autonomous and language independent reality deploys a style of depiction that captures an aura of presence and creates a sense that there is more to this world than what the text displays of it. In other words, a style of narrative fiction that offers the verbal equivalent of three dimensionality. The techniques that produce this sense of a whole three-dimensional story world are legion. They include providing the reader with instructions to enable the imagining of place, description, of the passage through time, plot, of plausible people, characterization, the choice of where to situate the narrative voice in relation to the imagined world is key with arguably the technique of style indirect libre or free indirect discourse, the invention of which is attributed both to Jane Austen and to Flaubert, providing a particularly, arguably providing a particularly immersive reading experience since it acknowledges the perspective of the external observer, the narrator and the reader, whilst adopting the character's point of view and voice enabling the reader to switch smoothly between external observation and mind reading, between sensory perception and empathetic envisioning of another consciousness, as we do in real life. Uh, we touched, I think, in Alex's paper on, on, on um, narrative point of view and how that relates to, to immersion. But realism, with its familiar, if almost infinitely variable narrative techniques, is not the only literary form to consider in relation to immersive reading. Research jointly undertaken by literary scholars and neuroscientists has shown how the disturbance of expected linguistic patterns, which is more characteristic of experimental or avant-garde writing perhaps than of realism, though it's not excluded from realism, but the, the disturbance of expected linguistic patterns can have a direct physical effect on the human brain, triggering that sudden spark of pleasurable shock that as readers, I think we can probably all recognize. Thus, when Shakespeare in one experiment employs what's called a functional shift, using one part of speech unexpectedly to stand in for another, as in Shakespearean examples, the dancers foot it with grace, where um, a noun becomes a, a verb, strong wines thick my thoughts, where an adjective becomes a verb. Electroencephalograms have recorded shifts in the neuroanatomy of readers' brains in this experiment when those words were read that activated areas of both right and left hemispheres not usually associated with linguistic processing but brought into play here by forms of language that challenge our habitual modes of comprehension. 
Wordplay, when it works, then can both intensify immersivity and stimulate non-habitual connections in the brain. It's what we might term the salutary shock of the unexpected. Thirdly, the next question is, why does immersive reading matter? Why is it valuable? Well, first of all, narrative is the organizing principle of cognition, the fundamental currency of selfhood. We build our sense of self through organizing the disparate events and components of our lives into a story. And people who suffer damage, those parts of the brain that function to construct narrative, display denarrated lives. Unable to tell a story about themselves, they lose that sense of identity that enables individuals to function. We are, in Nancy Houston's words, l'espèce fabulatrice. From birth, as Houston argues, we live in the medium of story. The world is constructed for us by family stories, by political and religious stories, by stories designed to make us avid consumers. Literary stories, which fully acknowledge their own fictional status, allow us to participate in story creation and to develop competence in the interpretation of those narratives that surround us. So in Houston's words, c'est parce que la réalité humaine est gorgée de fictions involontaires ou pauvres qu'il importe d'inventer des fictions volontaires et riches. And she also writes, en se présentant comme une fiction, en nous permettant de la choisir, la littérature nous dégage un temps des obligations et contraintes des innombrables fictions subies. Since narrative is a structure central to individual and social identity, its practice through reading and through other media can thus enrich both selfhood and the capacity to interpret the storytelling world around us. But beyond that, there is the now much research question that was also touched on yesterday of whether reading fiction fosters empathy. Overall, the answer seems to be yes, though with some qualifications, the most obvious of which is that reading fiction certainly does seem to correlate with good social skills, that is with the capacity to empathetically read other people and thus fully acknowledge the subjectivity of others. But is that because reading fiction enhances those skills or is it because people who have those skills tend to like reading fiction? What's most interesting though for our purposes here today is that some research has shown reading fiction to increase empathy scores only if the readers experienced transport, that is only if they became fully immersed cognitively and emotionally in the story. The simulation of psychological and emotional states beyond those of the reader's own direct experience, but as we've seen, activating the brain in exactly the same way, does appear to enrich consciousness and to increase the capacity for empathy. So the type of text that invites the reader to surrender critical distance and become lost in a story has been fairly comprehensively devalued by literary theory over the past century. Research shows that the vicarious experience gained through immersive reading can extend the reader's cognitive and emotional range. And to return to Nancy Houston, nous ouvrir un univers moral plus nuancé. Which leads me to my next section. So many different types of novel then can produce the immersive experience of being transported into a fictional world. One subgenre, however, that recurs in the history of popular reading, by which I mean reading for pleasure as opposed to reading with a notebook by your side. One that recurring sub-subgenre is the family saga, the story of a fictional family through two or more generations through which the history of a society is refracted and personalised. An effective family saga brings history to life through the reader's emotional investment in the fate of individual characters. 
dramatic plot and the texture of lived experience. French literature of the late 19th and 20th centuries produced powerful examples of this from Zola's Rougon Macquart cycle to the Roman Fleuve of the interwar years, a publishing phenomenon of remarkable proportions that's been strangely forgotten. And in a sense, I'm going off at a very slight tangent here, but it does feed back into the central line of argument. It's just that these are so little talked about and they're really interesting. Between 1920 and 1946, four massive multi-volume sagas were published to the international acclaim of readers and to some extent of critics. And I'm not going to go over them, but just you can see very quickly there, with Martin Dugard, UML, Romain and Roland, all produced these massive great sagas with the longest of them, 27 volumes. Um, they all um, are published within broadly the same interwar period into the just post Second World War period and the fictional period of time that they deal with is fairly similar as well. Each of them looks to the recent past, the belle époque of the decades leading up to 1914, from the other side of the cataclysmic divide of the First World War. They each focus on family, heredity and the complex, both willed and unintended, influence of one generation on the next. All four writers were politically progressive in the sense that as intellectuals, they were part of the internationalist, humanist European left. Their novel cycles reflect this, not just in the broadly political sympathies that inform their plots and characterization, but also in the democratic aims that drive their writing, transparency, accessibility, addressed to a wide readership. As um, Roland put it, parle pour être compris, non pas d'un groupe de délicats, mais par les milliers pour les plus humbles. And Martin Dugas, assez de subtilité de livres ennuyeux, assez de beauté ennuyeuse. Le beau peut avoir ce caractère entraînant, tenir en haleine uh, l'intérêt. You can see that, you know, their, their aims as writers. Uh, Martin Dugas also chose to have Les Thibault published by the more commercial and popular publisher. Um, Flammarion rather than by Elite uh, Gallimard. Arguably too, though it is virtually impossible to prove, the large and enthusiastic readership that these novels addressed was to a considerable extent female, not only because then as now women made up the majority of fiction readers, but also because by their very nature, family sagas deal with the home, the domestic, the domain of material and psycho-emotional reproduction that was, and arguably still is, gendered feminine. So that women are, to some extent in these male-authored novels, represented not solely as men's others, but rather also as focalizers and narrative agents. Rather than the singular hero of the modernist text, often himself, and it usually is himself, a writer, Proust, Gide, to name just the two most famous. The Roman Fleuve offers a panoply of different characters and sees the world from their diverse perspectives, emphasizing too the inseparability of individual identity from family and from the everyday interplay of domestic living. Although the central political and economic dramas of the Roman Fleuve are played out in the masculine, reflecting the reality of both the Belle Epoque era in which the plots are set and of the 20s and 30s when they were written, the Roman Fleuve has many of the characteristics of the interwar feminine middlebrow so prominent in Britain and so strangely absent in France. The very structure of the family saga, diffuse rather than leading teleologically to dramatic climax and closure, incremental rather than linear. That structure corresponds to the form of many feminine genres, the roman feuilleton, soaps, and reflects the cyclical amorphous rhythm of domestic lives. If there's something feminine about the roman fleuve's fecundity, polyphony, domestic focus and avoidance of singular climax, this would help to explain its predominantly negative or indifferent critical reception. In French women's writing, as opposed to reading, until recently, there don't seem to be many prominent examples of the family saga genre. 
no equivalent, for example, of Elizabeth Jane Howard's remarkable Casale saga, written mainly in the 1990s and set between the 30s and the 50s. But there are signs of its re-emergence. Alice Fernet has published variations on multi-generational family stories and notably Les Bourgeois, described um, on the, the, the cover as Un livre qui passe tout un siècle français ou tami du roman familial. Uh, Françoise Bourdon, uh, a popular stroke middle brow writer, um, has a family saga called La Maison du Cap very recently that's already in five volumes. Nancy Houston's um, Ligne de Faille um, used the, the tightly interwoven stories of three generations of family to address vital elements of world history from World War II to the present. And most interestingly, I think, two women writers of mixed French and North African descent have recently turned to the genre of the family saga to explore their own family histories in fictional form. Alice Zenitae, that of her Arki heritage in L'Art de Perdre, published in 2017, and which I strongly recommend, extremely immersive, and Leila Slimani, uh, that of her Franco-Moroccan family history in her planned three volume saga of which only the first, Le Pays des Autres, has yet been published. Modeling identity not as a process of heroic self-determination, but as profoundly shaped, enabled and circumscribed by the family dynamic. Both novels set women at the heart of history but extend an equally empathetic perspective to male characters. They're both long, L'Art de Perdre is over 600 pages, Slimani's text is over 400 and it's the first in a multi-volume series. And they're, and they're expansive, devoting space to the sensory evocation of place and period, situating the reader within a range of subjective perspectives on the world described. These are novels that invite an immersive reading. And it's this, their immersivity and their adoption of a popular and arguably outdated genre that perhaps explains their mixed critical reception. On the one hand, enthusiastic praise and prizes, L'Art de Perdre notably winning Le, Le Goncourt des Lycéens, and massive sales. Uh, on the other, critical doubt as to how far these historical sagas can be considered authentically literary. So the critic for Biblio Obs, uh, the Nouvelle Obs Online, wondered whether L'Art de Perdre was a roman à sujet ou véritable œuvre littéraire, the two apparently being incompatible. Uh, whilst, um, sorry, whilst, yes, yeah, sorry, whilst acknowledging that the novel transforme uh, l'histoire en saga familiale efficace, the critic regretted that, pour autant, le roman pâtit d'une écriture sans grand relief ni recherche littéraire. Écriture has an almost sacred status in French discourse, which I'm not sure I totally understand. The cultural radio programme Le Masque et la Plume noted how Le Pays des Autres divided critical opinion, with one critic finding the novel absolutely hypnotic en étant immersion dans un univers, and um, another one deploring Slimani's decision to se lancer dans une saga populaire on the grounds that this affidit son style d'écriture. Zénitaire's L'Art de Perdre, as I've said, is a compelling read that offers an illuminating perspective on the unsung history of the Arki, but I'm going to concentrate just on Slimani's novel here to, con to conclude, really, with a brief argument on how contemporary family saga novels achieve immersivity and why the revival of this underrated genre could be important. So my final section. Leila Slimani, as I think is well known, rose to fame as the author of Chanson Douce, winner of the 2016 Prix Goncourt, and has since become an international literary star, and as Macron's Minister for Francophone Affairs, a central figure in France's dealings with its situation as a post-colonial country. 
The novels that made her famous, uh, Dans le Jardin de l'Ogre, 2014, has also since the success of Chanson Douce being critically acclaimed internationally. These earlier novels are tightly constructed, disturbing stories set within a short contemporary time frame in metropolitan France and addressing pressure points in 21st century Western lives, especially those of women. Le Pays des Autres belongs to a very different genre. Set in Morocco in the late 40s and early 50s, it tells the story of a family and through this depicts the conflicts leading to the end of French colonial rule. Vocalization switches between several of the large cast of characters, both narrative and sentence structure are more exploratory and more layered than in earlier work. The relevance of a multi-generational take on the recent history of colonization and decolonization is clear. France, like other, like the UK and other ex-colonial powers, lives now in an era of cultural hybridity in which the identity of a significant proportion of the population is what Leonora Miano, a Franco-African writer, calls frontalière, une identité frontalière, poised between two or more cultures, shaped by a conflictual and often painful history, but to adopt Miano's optimistic angle on this, with the potential to open onto un champ des possibles les plus insoupçonnés. Have I put that on a PowerPoint? No, I haven't. Um, that's in Habiter la Frontière by, by Miano. Slimani's novel, like Ali Sanitaire's, offers an imagined, vicarious experience of the colonial history that created this hybrid present from the felt perspective of both parties in the colonial struggle. Mathilde, whose point of view uh, opens the novel, is a young French woman, initially naive in her exotic imaginings of colonial Morocco, her reaction to this new land suffused with her desire for the handsome Moroccan soldier, I mean, she met and married in her native Alsace as he fought for the French in World War II. Elle ne se lasse pas des mains d'Anine, de sa bouche, de l'odeur de sa peau, qui, elle le comprenait maintenant, avait à voir avec l'air de ce pays. Mathilde, for the most part, arrived in Morocco, valiantly takes on the less romantic reality of poverty, life in a sometimes brutally patriarchal culture, and the racism that extends to the white wife of a colonized man. She's imperfect, conflicted, sends her family back in France, highly romanticized accounts of her new life rather than admit the truth. But she's also intensely alive to the world around her, and the novel uses her foreign perspective on colonial Morocco to mirror that of the reader. Through Mathilde's experience, the reader registers the beauty and desolation of the countryside, the division between colonizers and native Moroccans that structures material life as well as social relations. And in the post-war decade of the novel setting is contested with increasing violence as the independence movement gains strength. Amin too inhabits Le Pays des Autres, whether as a Moroccan soldier in France in analeptic or flashback sequences, or in his own country as the westernized husband of a French wife, torn between nostalgia for his once unqualified allegiance to sa culture, son dieu, sa langue et sa terre, and recognition of the delight he feels in Mathilde and his children, and in the freer, more modern world he's in part embraced. Il lui semblait que sa vie était régie par un mouvement de balancier hystérique. Seen solely from an external perspective, Amin is a frequently taciturn husband and father, at times a domestic abuser, who brutally enforces oppressive traditions of female subordination on his younger sister, even as he envisages a much freer future for his daughter. But the novel extends focalization to Amin to draw the close connection between his behavior, the pain of being torn between cultures and the humiliation he suffers as a colonized subject, constantly addressed as tu, and for example, assumed to be the chauffeur by his daughter's white school friends. His outbursts of inexcusable violence, which are quite shocking in the text, 
are pitched against the awkward tenderness that he displays towards his wife and children that lead him in one episode to try very hard to lay on a happy Alsace-style treason presence Christmas for the homesick Mathilde. The focalization extends to, to Aisha, the daughter of Amin and Mathilde, whose story we assume will drive the next volume in the saga. Aisha too lives the hybridity of her dual culture inheritance in ways that are often painful. At school, the white French girls reject her, mocking her frizzy hair and lack of affluence. But the world of the Moroccan girls from wealthy families who are also at the convent school is equally foreign to her. Car Aisha n'était tout à fait une indigène, ni une de ces, ces Européennes qui sautait à pieds joints sur la marelle. Away from school, though, Aisha can experience a sense of exuberant belonging to the only land she knows. And it's through her eyes that the novel's closing scene of French colonial houses going up in flames, set on fire by the independence fighters, is viewed. Elle aurait pu crier tellement elle se sentait heureuse, qui brûle, pense-t-elle, qui s'en aille, qui crève. The irony being, of course, that she is also part of the il. Multiple minor characters from Amin's mother and siblings to the nuns who teach at Aisha's convent school also people the novel and add to the polyphony of, of not a voice, I've put of voices, but really of perspectives. It's a corporeal world of sensation in which complex emotion frequently finds expression in sensory perception. In one self reflexive passage, Mathilde torn between desire to belong and, and the sense that her statue d'étrangère la maintenait à l'écart des choses, de ce silence qui fait qu'on sait chez soi, tries to give written expression to l'odeur du cuir dans les trois tests des rues, celle du feu de bois et de la viande fraîche, l'odeur mêlée de l'eau croupie et des poitres mûres, de la bouche des ânes et de la cire de bois, mais elle n'avait pas de mots pour ça that the novel self-evidently finds the words. So in conclusion then, very, very briefly, immersive reading enables us not just to comprehend experience beyond our own in the cerebral sense, but to live it in virtual mode. It allows the reader to provisionally inhabit another's skin It allows the reader to inhabit another skin, to a, uh, another set of senses, another subjectivity. The family saga, with its attention to the intersections between public history and domestic living, its emphasis on the emotional force of heredity, provides a space and a structure of particular significance for those least remembered by conventional histories. Towards the end of Le Pays des Autres, Mathilde reflects on the 10 years that she's now spent in Morocco, while Amin has laboriously built what is now an, a flourishing farm. Quelle trace a été laissée? And the word trace came up two or three times yesterday in different papers, the concept of the, the trace. Quelle trace a été laissée? Mathilde asks herself, in a life composed of meals prepared, children comforted and sung to darning, mending, caring for the sick. Tout ce qu'elle accomplissait était voué à disparaître, à s'effacer. C'était le lot de sa vie domestique et minuscule. A trace, although we use the word commonly in a more abstract figurative sense, is primarily a physical mark. Through imagining this vie minuscule in its sensory reality, its material reality, which as the flashing shuttles of the brain weave their dissolving patterns is of course always more than sensory. Fiction allows us to revive the traces of the often unwritten, unpreserved pasts of women and of others erased or marginalized by historical memory. And to imagine them in all their solidity, vitality and dimensionality on the senses and in the heart. And that's my conclusion. Wonderful, thank you so, so much, Diana. Um, and if everyone would like to join me in thanking her.
Thank you. Um, also, apologies for failing to record the beginning of your talk. Um, thankfully, the majority of it was recorded and I can upload a transcript with the recording so that hopefully listeners can connect the dot that way. Um, but I do apologise. Um, but secondly, and more importantly, thank you for such a brilliant paper um, for exploring and explaining um, the machinations and the value of immersive um, fiction um, in all its complexities and yet in such a cogent and clear way. Um, that was perfect, um, really fascinating, thank you. Um, I, does anybody have any questions immediately? Um, before Ines, um, I do have a few questions, but I'd like to give the floor to attendees first, if anyone would like to start us off. Um, and as I said before, feel free to either raise your literal hand or your virtual hand, or just to pop questions into the chat. Yeah. People usually need okay. a bit. <laughs> yeah, okay, fine. Oh, Egle has one, um, if you'd like to start. Yeah, you? thank you, uh, Diana. Hi, Brilliant, really uh, fascinating. So it's just a very, very simple question, but I was sort of fascinated um, uh, with this idea that the family sagas are sort of maybe uh, coming back uh, and coming back in the in the feminine. And uh, I've been thinking um, about that because I, anyway, I wanted to ask you why you think uh, that might be the case, uh, you know, uh, um, like what are the sort of wider cultural uh, uh, movements or what might have led to that? Why, why now? Well, um, I, it, it, it seems to me though, obviously like everybody, I have a partial view of what's going on in French, fic French fiction. Um, but it seems to me that for quite a long time, what's predominated in women's writing in particular has been, um, a, a fairly introspective uh, autofiction is, of course, the dominant mode in, in French literature at the moment, but a, fa a fairly introspective, um, tightly constructed, formally experimental, self-consciously -consci self formally experimental kind of writing, which um, where the, the attention of the reader is necessarily constantly on the kind of surface of the text and how the text is working rather than being immersive. And I've, I was just really interested by the fact that two writers who have written very much in that kind of genre of, of, of um, you know, short, tight, shocking kind of texts should have turned to um, so recently to the family to something much more broad, exploratory, comprehensive, and that they should both be of, of North African origin. And I, th I think it, it's it's partly. I think on the one hand there may be a, um, a, a desire, which is evident in other places in French literature at the moment as well, to actually you know, tell stories in a way that engages a wide audience. Uh, but also, obviously, it, it is a way to explore the history, you know, their, their own history. Um, you know, that, that's what it seems to be about. It seems to be about trying to look at the, the history in the broad public sense as it has lived, particularly by those minorities who have not been so present in the the public accounts of um, of the recent mm. past. I think that maybe it has to do. I, I absolutely agree. I, I think that it has to do a lot with the desire to tell the design, the need maybe to tell the traumatic stories. And there is no other genre that lends itself better than a family mm. saga to exploring mm. generational and historical traumas. And I think that maybe well, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I think I think that maybe it's to do with the fact that women write, like women's presence, women's writing has got, come this far now where it is somehow allowed to explore histories of people like to, that didn't matter, you know, like, mm -hmm. where, you know, now they do matter. Now it is part of history. You know, it's very, very important to, mm. um, you know, they, they, those sort of narratives are now history with a big H. 
you know, because there has been so much sort of, um, you know, women have been written into history, they have been written into uh, into the public space. And now suddenly it is urgent that, you know, those little, those stories are, that they become part of the narrative. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, it, it, there's the question, it's to do with the concept of identity as well, I think. I mean, because of, for historical reasons, you know, the way that women, that women have, have possibly still do live <laughs> more, more than men, not, not, not that men, men don't, but um, the, the awareness of being enmeshed in a chain, in a chain of generations of being both partly determined by what has gone before and by what comes after of what Nancy Houston's called, you know, what is dealing with what is dealt as opposed to what is an act of free volition, which dominated in existentialism, for example, you know, self, self creation, self making. I think it's harder to envisage oneself as a completely isolated, self-created individual um, within the norm, and not all women's lives, but within the norm of women's lives. So that the family saga, that's why I'm, I can only speculate that women have always read a lot of family sagas. Like it's very hard to prove who reads what. But as readers, I think it's always been a, a, a genre of interest. And, and now it's becoming also a, a genre that women have, have kind of taken over to some extent. Thank you very much, Diana. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Egle, for your question. Um, and I see Caroline's also read her, uh, raised her hand, and Adina said in the chat that you'd like to raise a question first. Um, so um, I think Adina maybe mentioned it first. So Adina, would you like to start, and then Caroline? Yes, if that's okay. Um... Uh, thank you very much, Diana, for your paper. Um, I was wondering, and this would be, might be a question that you've been answering throughout, and I'm probably asking you to speculate, but um, I was thinking about how do you believe, how do you think that today's readers um, engage with the family saga? Because our ways of experiencing and consuming culture have changed. We, mm -hmm. of course, tend to binge series, binge movies, and I particularly like uh, losing myself in the world. And once I'm out of that world, I do experience a sense of loss. So I'm kind of wondering how do readers respond to these families, sag family sagas and these, for instance, free volume sagas that are mm -hmm. to be continued um, as is this Slimani's, Slimani's case, sorry. Well, well, yes, I mean, I, I can only speculate. Do you mean, does do, do contemporary attention spans preclude um, the, the lengthy reading experience required by 400, 600 page, page books? Yes and no. Mm. Um, I'm trying to, well, I'm wondering whether our desire to lose ourselves in a, in a different world, mm -hmm. um, the impulse we have, for instance, to binge watch series, uh, would transfer to uh, really long novels, for instance. Oh, I see. Well, you know, quite possibly, quite possibly. Uh, and for some reason, Harry Potter comes immediately to mind, and 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 you know, the the, the passionate reading that is required. Um, I have grandchildren, you know, so the older ones of whom are currently reading. So I actually see it happening. That you know, those novels are gigantic, and and there are millions of children all over the world not just in English countries who are at choosing to to disappear into those books and to stay in them for time which is perhaps equivalent or feels similar in, in the immersive sense to getting lost in a, a series on television and so on so I haven't I haven't thought of it but it may it, it may, um, paradoxically, in, in a sense, given what everything that is said about contemporary funds of concentration, but it may be something that that could hook up to the sort of series, um, you know, the, the screen immersion that, that the, the very young contemporary generation have gained the habit of. Possibly, um, yeah, it is speculative. Thank you. Um, and Caroline, do you want to ask your question now? 
Thanks, Polly. Thank you very much, Diana. That was that was fascinating. And it's not so much a question, maybe as, as a comment uh, following on uh, on Edley's question. But, um, it's just I was uh, thinking while you were talking um, about maybe the notion of meaning. You were talking about traces, and this is a word, as you were uh, rightly saying, that has been mentioned several times over the last couple of days. And it was making me think back on uh, Michelle's talk a couple of days ago about this uh, need to actually um, find some meaning and uh, making sense maybe of history and what happened uh, with relation to family trauma as well. Uh, and maybe this, uh, this family saga could be a way of not only making sure that something is not disappearing, but also making sense of a, a longer um, family story uh, going back, you know, um, several generations, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, I thought I think the, the the meaning is also something that could be uh, mm -hmm. an interesting notion to include in, in, in there, um, and it also made me think um, about trauma. And uh, while you were talking about Slimani, I thought about about Delphine de Vigan as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, even though it wasn't necessarily a family saga, but uh, I can't remember the title now, it's just behind me, um, uh, when she was talking about a mother and, and the whole family. And you can mm -hmm. definitely see how this going back um, into the kind of family and, and the trauma and maybe the kind of uncomfortable part of our history can just be um, not just a way of uh, making sure that things don't disappear, but making sense yeah, rien se pose any. Thank you very much, Michelle. That's the one I was I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe more a comment than a question, but I think mm -hmm. it makes sense uh, getting some meaning out of something that is not necessarily comfortable might also be another another reason there. Just yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I, I I think that's right. I mean the um the the, the absurd the absurdist view of life, um, which has been very powerful in the twentieth century anyway. Uh, rests on the sense of each individual as, as a lone unit. And, and in that case, then mortality and one's total disappearance, you know, does indeed seem to preclude any overall meaning, any sense of actually having had a meaning in the, uni in the universe. Whereas a view that returns to history and sees the, the, the cumulative um, or the, the cyclical, you know, the cumulative meaning of, of a whole kind of family history written of a, of a fam, of, a, of generations written into history is, is, a, is finally a much more um, bearable vision of, of, li of life, isn't it? Isn't it? To see oneself as, as part of a, an ongoing chain. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Alex Kerman, would you like to ask your question now? Thank you. Thanks very much, Diana. I was really struck um, by some of your phrasing at the beginning um, of your, your keynote, and you said that literature is so familiar as to become invisible. I found that really beautiful. And it seems to me there might be a parallel between this and uh, like dom the domestic scenes, the corporal experiences that you mentioned um, that were particularly captivating in Slimani's um, text. And I wonder, um, so those are familiar scenes as well. And I wonder if there's something about the familiar when the familiar or the invisible is rendered visible that makes for immersive literature. I guess it's talking, speaking to your you know, comments about realism as well, actually in hindsight. Um, it's just a thought I had. So, so that, oh, I see what you mean. Yes, there's, a, there's an analogy between the way that, um, the, the very familiar techniques, let's say, of realism, for example, have, have, bec have become invisible. So that the, mir the miraculous nature of how those, <laughs> those signs create a whole world, it, 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 the analogy is then with how um, similarly the, the, the everyday business of going about, you know, caring for people and making the world function also just become invisible because so familiar. Yeah, so mm. making the very familiar visible, perhaps, mm. is... Becomes immersive somehow. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was just a just a parallel that came to me, but I think you, you summed it up very nicely, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. Okay, that's a, no, it's a nice analogy, yeah. Thank you. 
Oh, and we have another question for Michel Bachol. Um, thank you, Diana. That was fascinating. I will have a lot of questions about the psychological aspect, but <laughs> maybe we're not going to go there. Uh, I was during your talk. I was racking my brain. Okay, what did I read that was that felt like a family saga? You know, uh, and came to mind. So it's more. I have a comment, and then I have a very quick question. Uh, came to mind. Uh, Régine Desforges, uh, La Bicyclette Bleue, Saint Henri Martin, et yes, Les Diables. Yeah. It's not so much a fan. I thought about that one, but it, it's yeah. a saga, but it's not a family saga. No, I know. We stick with the heroine the whole way through. Right. And it's a very short period of time, too. It's the Second World War, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The other one I thought about, which is not quite a family saga, so pointing to the fact that there is none, right? I'm, so mm -hmm. I'm still trying. Uh, Janine Boissard, L'Esprit de Famille, that okay. was in the late 70s and mm -hmm. early 80s, I believe, but it's it's about a family, right? So you're focusing Janine on- Janine Boissard, okay. Janine Boissard. Mm. Boissard. On different sisters. So you don't have the history aspect, mm. um, but they weren't, neither of them, uh, Desforges and, and Boissard were taken very seriously anyway. No. So, um, so my question um, is about Slimani. Um, this trilogy, um, announced trilogy, right, mm -hmm. uh, came after two huge successes. So do you think she would have started with a family saga? Mm -hmm. Or I don't know, did she mention anything about, you know, having, thinking about that, uh, that novel, these novels for a while or, or not? I wonder no, if- No, I've, I've read some of her. Yeah, I mean, I've read, I've looked at some of the interviews and so on, what she's talked about, I haven't seen anything about that. I don't think that that's a really interesting question. I don't think she'd have had the success with it that she has if she hadn't done Chanson Douce first. It would have been, it would have passed, you know, invisible, <laughs> invisibly, inaperçu, more or less, because it's it's seen as a, um, a, a slightly, I think as a slightly outdated or not particularly interesting form. Uh, it was because of the, the, shock, the shock value and the success of, of Chanson Douce, I think, that this has been taken seriously. Yeah, good point. Mm. And, I, and I don't think she had in mind, no, writing. The, she still has to defend it also. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. I have just popped a message in the chat to say to everybody, if you'd like to take a quick comfort break now before the next panel, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, I uh, had a couple of questions for Diana. I don't, um, if you want to take a comfort break yourself, Diana, please. No, it's fine. Down. It's fine. Are you sure. Yes. I'll <laughs> okay. grab a coffee after. Great. Thank you. Um, I had a question, first of all, um, in terms of when you were talking about the Roman Fleuve authors, you said um, that they um, gave lots of consideration for who they would be published by. Mm. Um, so I wondered. Well, one of them anyway. Mm. Yes, one of them. Sorry. So um, my, I was wondering how that relates to Slimani. Um, mm. In term, yeah. How does the publication of her works fit in with, um, I suppose, the the reach of her immersive mm. fiction? Mm -hmm. um, and my second question was about um, when you referred to Braille at the in your opening um, introduction. Uh, it made me think about the physicality of reading. Um, so reading a physical copy mm. of a book versus a digital copy, for example, mm. um, and also about where we're reading a book. So you mentioned being disturbed by the doorbell going, for example. Um, so some people might prefer to be in a library or you might be on a beach and all of that can affect um, mm. how, how um, immersed you can be in the narrative. So I was wondering whether there were any kind of instructions at all within uh, Slimani's works or others um, that you mentioned about how exactly we should read the, mm. the narratives. Mm, okay, um, I think that, that, that I'll take the second question first. You know, I think it's really interesting about the whole posture and and physicality of of, of reading itself. There aren't exactly instructions in 
um, Le Pays des Autres, though the books don't figure a huge amount, but they are important to Mathilde. And there's a, a, an, a, a, a really nice moment where Mathilde has a crise de paludisme, where she, she's really quite ill. And there's a, a, a neighboring character, another of these minor characters who are just interesting, though briefly perceived. Um, who's a good, who's a, a kind woman, you know, and generally on the side of the angels politically and so on. But what she does when she realizes how that how ill Mathilde is feeling is she get she has a, a big book collection. She's French in origin, though she's lived in Morocco for forever. And what she does is she brings around a load of novels <laughs> for her to read. Um, but the books there there aren't exactly instructions. Um, I, I think I think this may be generational, but. Uh, I, I'm not too sure, but certainly in, in my own case, I so much prefer to have a physical book in my hands than to I, reading on screen. I find quite uncomfortable, and partly there's a very nice art, a, a very nice article by Nicola Humble, who's written about the English middle brow, called um, "Sitting Forward and Sitting Back," and she. She has um, a highbrow mode of reading, which as academics, you know, we all do a lot of the time is sitting forward. So you're sitting like this, and, you know, a middle brow or popular mode of reading is sitting back with, you, with your book. And even sitting back or lying back or lying on the beach with a Kindle, I don't find as agreeable and pleasurable an experience as actually having a book in my hands. There is some evidence in, re in research to suggest that your attention is more um, acute when you actually have the physical object, that the physicality of turning pages and so on has an effect on the brain, on how you actually read, as opposed to the sort of slightly distancing effect of, of, of looking at a screen. And I was thinking yesterday in some of the papers that I find it um, in, in some of the, in, the installations that were talked about that are present and they are interactive, but in an art gallery, but then you can also watch them on screen on your own after. And I was thinking I'd find it very hard to be immersed in uh, anything like a, a story in an art gallery with other people around me standing up with a, um, you know, a book in front of me. I, I do think that the whole question of the posture of reading and the, the feel of, of what's going on around you in the um, in, in the the external world, you know, the other world of which you're always dimly conscious when you're lost in a book, uh, is is significant and, and really worth thinking about. I was given a number of some books for Christmas which are hardback because they're relatively new, and I must say I've noticed how because I've been thinking about this, I've noticed how I vert, I kind of almost caress the books, you know, <laughs> just beautiful objects which um, somehow enhance still further the experience of disappearing into their world. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Oh, so, sorry, you asked me something more straightforward. About publication, yes. Oh, yes. Um, I, uh, I, it, I would only say, picking up again, really, on Michelle's question, that because of having been so successful before, and actually, to a lesser extent, Zenithair had been successful with her preceding couple of novels, um, straight into folio, uh, you know, Le Pays des Autres, straight into folio, because of the, the previous successes. And, and that's, you know, I'm sure that's where she'd want to be in, in, in folio with this, with these books. Mm. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, Ooh. and uh, Michelle's added uh, Une saga des années 80 yes. de Nuzière, Louisiane, six volumes. Yeah, I've just lost the, lost the chat, but I, I was, um, I was aware of that. Uh, yeah, there are, there are a number of, of sagas, historical sagas by male writers, aren't there, in the uh, 50s, 50s, 60s, around there, yeah. And lots of thanks in the chat. Yes. <laughs> um, does anybody have any final questions before we get started for the next panel? People probably need a quick break, I should think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, thank you, Polly. Thank you. Thank you for such a brilliant paper. 
Um, that was wonderful. And many thanks to everybody for your questions as well, um, which allowed yes. such a rich discussion. Okay. <laughs> See you shortly. For everyone, at least it's good morning for me. Uh, and thank you for attending today's virtual panel entitled Immersive Multimedia. Oh, today's actually Immersive Cinema, I believe. I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Eric Wistrom, and I'll be your chair for panel five. We have two very exciting presentations today that are dedicated to building the conceptual framework of immersion. The first focusing on Chantal Ackerman's 1976 film, News From Home, and the second on Teresa Hak Young Cha's creation of immersive cinematic spaces. Today, I'll introduce each presenter and then turn the mic over to them so that they can present. I would ask that you hold your questions until the end of both presentations to ensure adequate time for discussion. And given the online platform today, I would additionally ask that everyone mute their microphone when not speaking to avoid any unnecessary distractions when our panelists are speaking. And lastly, since portion of the symposium will be recorded for archival purposes, I would ask that you turn off your camera if you do not wish to be recorded. So our first presenter today is Sophie Coombs. Sophie is a French honor student at the University of Queensland. Her honors thesis focuses on the role of the maternal and authorial voice in Chantal Ackerman's 1976 film, News From Home. Her research interests include autobiographical cinema, experimental feminist cinema, as well as a relationship between film and visual art. Her presentation today is entitled Portrait de les cinéastes en tant que jeune femme, a rereading of Chantal Ackerman's News from Home as a Journey to Artistic Subjectivity. And thank you, Sophie, when you're ready, go ahead. All right, thanks, thanks, Eric. Uh, before I begin today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners uh, of the lands on which I'm presenting from, the Yagara and the Turrbal peoples. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Okay, I'll just share my screen. Ok, j'aimerais commencer en signalant que cette présentation sera en français euh, puisqu'elle est une version raccourcie de mon mémoire de maîtrise qui a été écrit en français aussi. Euh, donc, mon mémoire de maîtrise avait pour objet de de proposer une nouvelle interprétation du film News from Home de Chantal Ackerman, un texte filmique qui jusqu'ici euh, s'est avéré assez résistant à une lecture détaillée. Euh, dans cette présentation, nous avancerons une lecture de News from Home comme un récit d'initiation atypique qui s'élabore à partir de la voix et la vision de la cinéaste. Cette lecture sera guidée par les théories de Kaya Silverman sur la voix féminine au cinéma. Donc, la cinéaste Chantal Ackerman était l'une des réalisatrices les plus importantes de la dernière moitié du XXe siècle. Euh, son œuvre était riche et hétéroclite, comprenant une gamme étonnante de styles et de genres tels que le mélodrame, la comédie musicale et même le documentaire. Sans équivoque, son film le plus connu est Jeanne Dillman, 23 pieds du commerce, Bruxelles, euh, qui a été décrit comme une sorte de classique féministe. Mais un film d'Ackerman qui a reçu nettement moins d'attention est bien sûr News from Home. Euh, ce long métrage s'inspire de l'avant-garde américain et donc a un style beaucoup plus expérimental que le reste de son travail. Euh, afin d'illustrer davantage la nature énigmatique du texte filmique dont il est question dans cette communication, euh, commençons avec quelques détails essentiels sur le film. Donc, News from Home se compose uniquement des plans de l'île de, de Manhattan, euh, la caméra capte des New Yorkais dans le métro, des piétons traînant au coin des rues et des voitures qui rôdent dans des allées. Cet amalgame d'images de la ville est accompagné par une voix off qui n'a rien à voir avec le plan visuel du film. Sur la bande sonore, la spectatrice est bercée par la voix d'Ackerman lisant des lettres de sa mère. La narratrice relate des nouvelles de la Belgique, mais sa voix se trouve parfois noyée par les bruits de la ville. Euh, ce film expérimental ne comprend pas un récit évident. Toutefois, il y a une conclusion très claire au film, représentée par un travelling en arrière d'environ 10 minutes, où l'on aperçoit l'île de Manhattan s'éloigner depuis le pont d'un bateau. Alors, face à ce film qui s'avère très différent aux autres longs métrages ackermaniens, il n'y a qu'une gamme très limitée d'études secondaires qui ont tenté de le théoriser. 
puisque les lettres lues en voix off viennent d'un premier séjour à New York où la, que la cinéaste a entrepris à l'âge de 21 ans euh, en 1971, la plupart de ses études concentrent sur l'aspect autobiographique du film. Alors, de façon intéressante, plusieurs études mentionnent qu'Ackerman a quitté la Belgique sans mot dire, ce qui explique les propos parfois très exaspérés de la mère dans quelques-unes des lettres. Bien que ce film soit autobiographique, force est de constater qu'il ne s'agit point d'une autobiographie typique. On devrait plutôt parler euh, d'une sorte d'autoreprésentation indirecte, puisque la, ciné... puisque la voix de la cinéaste semble même parfois entrer en compétition avec euh, le vacarme de la ville. Euh... Alors, euh, afin de comprendre ce que cette autobiographie atypique serait en train de nous dire, nous avons décidé d'écouter de... la voix octoriale de façon très attentive. Plus spécifiquement, nous, avons penché, nous nous sommes penchés sur un des aspects sous-théorisés du film, c'est-à-dire les éléments sonores. Et pour ce faire, nous avons eu recours aux théories de Kaya Silverman sur la voix féminine au cinéma. Alors, Silverman a proposé une sorte de modèle psychanalytique pour la revalorisation de la voix féminine dans le cinéma. Hum que je résumerai maintenant brièvement avant de parler des conclusions de notre analyse. Donc, essentiellement, Silverman reprend les idées avancées par Dora Mulvey, euh, qui a argumenté que le cinéma classique est fondé sur une castration symbolique qui représente une menace au pouvoir des spectateurs masculins. Afin de désavouer ce manque des spectateurs masculins, les personnages féminins du diégèse sont fétichisés et rendus passifs par le dispositif cinématographique. Donc, en ajoutant à cet argument, Silverman révèle que cette passivité s'impose également sur la voix du sujet féminin euh, dans le cinéma dominant. Donc, typiquement, la voix d'un personnage féminin demeure ancrée à ce corps qui est fétichisé par la caméra. Euh, la voix masculine, au contraire, a nettement plus de pouvoir au sein du diégèse, puisqu'elle est associée soit avec les personnages masculins qui exercent de l'autorité dans le récit, soit au narrateur masculin qui exerce du pouvoir sur le récit. Alors, face à cette inégalité à l'écran, Silverman propose que la voix féminine, qui a le potentiel d'être libérée de ce corps fétichisé, pourrait devenir justement euh, un agent d'émancipation féminine. Alors, cherchant à construire un modèle psychanalytique qui met la voix féminine dans une position de pouvoir, Silverman invoque l'idée du Cora. Donc, l'auteur élabore son concept du Cora à partir de plusieurs essais de Julia Kristava, qui le décrit comme une enveloppe sonore et parfois corporelle qui encadre la mère et son enfant. Euh, mais loin de revendiquer le potentiel féministe de cet espace maternel immersif, Christava maintient que la rupture du Cora est nécessaire pour la formation de l'identité chez l'enfant. Contrairement au Cora sémiotique de Christava, euh, Silverman insiste sur une fantaisie du Cora qui peut persister après l'entrée au langage en tant que symbole de séparatisme et solidarité féminin. Euh, crucialement, en franchissant le système du langage, le Cora de Silverman porte l'accent sur l'agentivité de la femme et le pouvoir discursif de sa parole. Mais alors, comment ce modèle se traduit-il à l'écran euh, Pour Silverman, il s'agit de privilégier la voix féminine et de subvertir des conventions acceptées du cinéma classique en expérimentant avec des voix désincarnées, justement comme on le voit dans New Home, Home, peut-être avec des voix asynchrones et des voix off plurielles qui forment un espace femme sur le plan sonore. Alors, dans News from Home, la voix off protectrice qui demande constamment si Ackerman est heureuse, si elle a les moyens de vivre et si elle va rentrer en Belgique, partage de fortes résonances avec cette idée du Cora. Pourtant, la nature unilatérale de cette correspondance donne l'impression que ces expressions amoureuses ne sont pas réciproques. 
nous nous sommes demandé alors si le Cora dans Nuit from Home correspond vraiment aux idées de plénitude et de solidarité féminine qu'il représente pour Silverman, ou si l'on assiste à une sorte de désintégration du Cora, euh, comme le préconise Christava. Donc, au cours de notre analyse des éléments sonores du film, nous avons constaté que le schéma rassurant des lettres se trouve progressivement plus brouillé par les bruits de la ville. Comme si la mère anticipait cet étouffement de ses paroles, le contenu des, le contenu des lettres révèle des doutes au niveau de l'adresse, signalant peut-être l'affaiblissement de cette enceinte maternelle. Pourtant, c'est dans la dernière séquence narrée du film que la voix maternelle est emportée définitivement par les rumeurs de la ville. Lors d'une scène de route, la spectatrice s'efforce à capter des fragments des, des nouvelles de la Belgique, mais finalement, le bruit de la circulation fait que nous n'entendons point la dernière moitié de la lettre. La phrase rassurante « ta maman qui t'aime », qui termine chaque correspondance, n'arrive jamais. Ainsi, nous voyons une évolution subtile mais claire au niveau du, du Cora qui s'avérerait cohérente avec la notion christavienne que la destruction de cet espace est une étape nécessaire dans la naissance de la subjectivité. Cependant, l'on note aussi la, la persistance remarquable de cette litanie maternelle quasiment tout au long du film. Effectivement, il n'y a ni une adoration profonde, ni une violence particulière envers le Cora, mais plutôt, je dirais, une ambivalence à son égard. Ackermann écoute sa mère, mais seulement par intermittence. Elle réalise même parfois une subversion ludique de ses paroles maternelles. Ceci s'exemplifie clairement dans une scène où le monologue maternel l'a pris de, de faire attention en sortant la nuit, puisque New York est une ville dangereuse. Euh, mais comme pour lancer un clin d'œil espiègle à la spectatrice, Ackerman couple cet appel à la prudence avec un plan de soir de cette même métropole menaçante. Alors cette manipulation des paroles de la mère signale qu'Ackerman n'a plus besoin de la fonction protectrice de la, du Cora et qu'elle tente peut-être de trouver sa propre voie. À la lumière de cette indépendance croissante que l'on entend sur le plan sonore, nous nous sommes demandé alors si ce film met en scène une sorte de quête identitaire chez Ackerman, voire le récit d'initiation de la cinéaste. Dans l'intention de mener plus loin cette hypothèse, nous avons d'abord contemplé la nature du récit d'initiation dont il pourrait être question dans ce film, en examinant une variété de théories sur la version littéraire du genre, avant de retourner aux écrits de Silverman, notamment son idée d'une voix d'autrice du cinéma. Alors, l'ancêtre de tout récit d'initiation filmique est bien sûr le roman d'apprentissage que Michael Bakhtin définit comme le roman de formation de l'homme dans une acceptation très large. Alors, le protagoniste de ce genre de récit était bien sûr obligé de quitter le foyer familial, à suivre une éducation formelle ou bien informelle, et à, à se consacrer à un métier avant de, de s'intégrer à la société. Alors, si ce film qui nous fait songer à Ackermann, jeune et seul, dans une métropole étrangère en train de se débrouiller, semble déjà suivre le schéma d'un récit d'initiation, c'est sans doute celui de la version masculine du genre, où c'est la liberté du protagoniste qui importe. Contre, contrairement à son homologue masculin, le récit initiatique féminin entraîne la perte progressive de l'indépendance pour ses protagonistes, qui étaient obligés de, à se soumettre aux exigences de la société telles que la première expérience sexuelle avec un homme, le mariage et ensuite l'accouchement. Ce type de récit est, pour théoricienne Anna Spratt, plutôt question de « growing down » au lieu de « growing up ». Même si Nussle manifeste de façon claire l'indépendance d'Ackerman, le spectre d'un récit d'initiation féminin traditionnel demeure toujours au niveau de la voix off. Plus précisément, les lettres de la mère d'Ackerman communiquent constamment de l'information sur d'autres jeunes femmes en Belgique. 
entre Irène avec son nouveau fiancé, Eline qui se marie le 25 août et Lily qui vient d'avoir un enfant, le chemin de vie qu'Ackerman aurait pu prendre commence à se dessiner. Or, les prises de vue du film, tournées pendant des déambulations lentes et libres, nous indique peut-être qu'Ackerman hésite devant ses rites socio-féminins. Justement, cette idée de, de l'errance du chemin prescrit par la société rappelle des autres films autoréférentiels de la cinéaste, tels que « Les rendez-vous d'Anna » et « Saute ma ville », dans lesquels sa méfiance envers des conventions patriarcales et hétéronormatives cristallise. Alors, mais dans ce, dans ce film, dans « Nuit from Rome », Ackerman est plutôt face à un carrefour, littéralement ainsi que figurativement. Et comme nous montrerons par la suite, c'est précisément en flânant, en déambulant et en développant son regard de cinéaste que le chemin à prendre commence à se dessiner pour Ackerman. À partir des 30 dernières minutes du film, l'on remarque que les mouvements de caméra deviennent subtilement plus décisifs, les panoramiques plus osés. Presque comme si la personne derrière la caméra gagnait progressivement plus de confiance. Ce film n'est finalement pas question d'un récit de vie féminin traditionnel, mais plutôt le récit d'initiation d'Ackerman en tant que cinéaste. Plus précisément, nous avons argumenté que ceci est un film qui traite de la naissance de ce que Silverman appelle la voix octoriale de la cinéaste. Alors, en réponse à la théorie des auteurs, auteur theory, euh, qui a largement ignoré toute question de différence sexuelle, Silverman a créé un schéma psychanalytique pour repérer une voix d'autrice de cinéma qui ne serait pas autrement reconnue euh, par les critiques. Alors, euh, selon Silverman, les films d'une autrice de cinéma euh, ont une certaine cohérence libidinale entre entre eux, qui s'établit à partir de la répétition des éléments visuels, sonores et thématiques. Alors, malgré la diversité de l'œuvre d'Ackerman, il y a, comme le remarque Brenda Longfellow, une figure récurrente qui hante ses films, à savoir sa mère. En effet, Ackerman a incorporé sa propre mère tout au long de son œuvre, jusqu'à son dernier film, No Movie. Mais News from Home, le premier film qui, qui traite le premier film d'Ackerman qui traite d'une relation mère-fille est bel et bien le site où la mère d'Ackerman est, est devenue sa muse en quelque sorte. Au cours de notre analyse, nous avons observé que dans ce film, comme dans tout récit d'initiation de jeunes femmes, la relation d'Ackerman à sa mère a changé. Ce n'est plus un lien de dépendance. Avec la distance, elle s'est métamorphosée en une appréciation créatrice. Pour conclure, il est évident que Ackerman ne prendra pas le chemin de la femme au foyer. Plutôt, elle passera sa vie à l'écouter, à la regarder et à la filmer en tant que cinéaste. Alors, j'aimerais conclure euh, avec quelques remarques sur la séquence finale du film, euh, qui est un travelling en arrière de 10 minutes, où l'on aperçoit un vaste étendu d'océan entre la caméra et l'horizon new-yorkais. Que cette scène soit un retour à la mer ou un retour à la mer, euh, une chose est sûre, la cinéaste n'est plus la même personne qu'avant. Comme le mouvement lent mais décisif de la caméra nous indique, Ackerman a trouvé sa voie, mais aussi sa voix dans le monde du cinéma. Donc, ça, c'est tout pour moi. Donc, merci de m'avoir écouté. Donc, je passe la parole à Eric. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, Sophie, for your presentation. That was extremely interesting and we very much enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, our next presenter today is Madalena Eckar. Madalena holds a previous Bachelor of Arts in English Literature and has just completed a Master of Arts in Literary Studies from Goldsmiths University. Her interests span language and semiology, feminism, critical thinking, academic and creative writing, and literary criticism. Originally from Italy, she lives in London and aspires to write and further explore her interests professionally. Her presentation today is entitled Another Word, Another Image, Poetic and Visual Experimentation in the Transformative Narratives of Teresa Hack Kyung Cha. All right, thank you, Madalena. When you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you, Eric. I'll get straight into it. Let me just share my screen. Um, can you all see that? 
Okay. Um, my presentation aims to introduce the work of a relatively obscure Korean American artist, filmmaker, and writer, Theresa Hachin Cha. Born in Korea during the Korean War, Cha moved to the US and reached artistic maturity in the 1980s, having immersed herself in the culture and artistic landscape of the University of California, Berkeley, where she acquainted herself with literature and cinema, French filmmakers and critics of the time in particular. What drew me to the work of this artist are her amalgamations of visual and written media and her use of textual hybridity, what could be termed an element of extra dimensionality in her oeuvre, um, to deal with political and aesthetic issues of representation and displacement. Her magnum opus dicte, a multimedia, multilingual project reflective of notions of autobiography, history and identity, um, aims to creatively work with semiotic patterns to rescue a marginalized subject within history from the unidirectional gaze of colonization, political division and patriarchal systems. This is also our artistic project throughout the performance art and short films. My paper explores the extraordinary way Cha undermines and reshapes hegemonic narratives through visual and written experimentation, thus reframing the roles of reader and writer and filmmaker and spectator. In an interview, Cha described her work as an exploration of language structures inherent in written and spoken material, photographic and filmic images, the creation of new relationships of meaning in the simultaneity of these forms. My paper explores a creative use of visual and written media through the creation of immersive fictional spaces and aims to highlight how Cha revolutionizes the way in which we think about language and thus how signs and images are read and used. Cha's oeuvre betrays the desire to take apart hegemonic dictates rooted in the process of, uh, in the processes of speaking, seeing and being and to reframe the response stimulus to a work of art through a creative re-evaluation of semiotic structures, blurring the boundaries between creator and receptor. These are some stills from Permutations, one of Cha's early short films, which introduces many of the problematics around visual communication that are explored in a further work. The film is composed of six camera shots ordered in succession of one second intervals. In it, the artist toys with the various variations of meaning that inhabit the player's signification. As a subject for a minimalist video, Cha chose a sister Bernadette, a close relation to herself, yet also crucially different from her. The film features brief repetitive sequences and captures Bernadette's gaze as she stares uh, directly into the camera at times breaking this connection with the viewer by turning her head or averting her eyes. Crucially, the viewer is never told who the subject in the video is. This prompts a uh, problematization of stable concepts of identity. Despite the clarity of the subject's gaze in the frontal shots, Bernadette's stare remains enigmatic and cryptic. The film is meant to be actively watched. Its ambiguity and style challenge the viewer's knowledge of what she is looking at. The continued stare of its subjects in contrast to the tomb-like silence and perpetually unstable identity. And yet, the omission of signification and explanation in the clips is concurrently paired with dynamic transfers of meaning. Within permutations, Chuck creates an amalgamation of selves and prompts a conflation of viewer, artist, and the object of art, which results in an exchange of subjectivities and the mixing of transnational voices, presenting an idea of identity and consciousness that results from an endless play of permutations of selves. The theory offered by Charles' video is that observer and protagonist are not typeset into the mold of conventional history, but working together through an, um, an act of continuous exchange between you and I. Observations of their relationship between subject and object as embedded within visual and written communication are also present in Cha's 1977 piece, Audience Distant Relative. Within what can be defined a postal artwork, Cha addresses her audience as if it was a distant relative. Throughout this piece, Cha profoundly disturbs the idea that there are definite boundaries between the role of the writer and that of the reader, subject and object, sender and receiver, as she problematizes the conception of a binary, unidirectional relationship between one and the other. 
She puts forth the theory that during artistic and linguistic exchange, the artist and the audience inhabit a communal creative space. Cha was influenced by the Lithuanian semitician A.J. Gramas. He theorized four poles of the narrative process, the sender, subject, object, and receiver. He described this process as being founded on positions of logical relationships, thus believing linguistic communication to be, quote, graced with a permanence guaranteed by a systematic structure. In an intriguing diversion from this model, Cha borrows its structure yet disrupts its atomistic and linear thought processes from audience distant relative, um, in our relationship, I am the object, you are the subject. You are the object, I am the subject. You are the subject, I am the object. I am the subject, you are the object. According to chat, send and receive a subject and object within the space of art are not only related, but intrinsically bound in a set of imbrications and entanglements, so much so that they oftentimes merge and become indistinguishable from each other. She calls this in her writings on the artistic process an interfusion of subject and object. Charles' work heralds the thought that wishing to pin down these relationships to a precise mechanic equals to imprisoning the subject in the static categories, thus removing it from a locus of transnationality, dynamism and inclusion. It is only in the contact zone between sender and receiver, object, object and subject, eye and screen, that the subject of art can become apparent. The desire to immerse the viewer in a work of art can also be seen in uh, some of Charles' performances um, I've put to uh, on the screen, where the artist can be seen moving in and out of projections. This adds a layer of meaning to the visual narrative of the performance and demands a disruption of conventional patterns of meaning making and visual receptivity. By intruding the screen space, to add a third eye and object to it, thus prompting a supplementary level of interpretation. In this context, it is also worth noting that the experience of watching a film involves a doubling effect where the audience is both here and now, passively sat in the cinema, and there and then, within the space of the screen as the spectator identifies with the characters and immerses herself in the fictional world of the film. Chai self wrote that during a screening, the artist establishes a covenant with his elements, as well as with each member of the audience. The artist becoming object for the viewer, the viewer is subject, the artist is subject, the viewer is object. The cinematic screen is seen as a dynamic place that toys with conceptions of destination and departure evoking a border country where you, I, and they interact and enter into a relationship. Um, whilst musing on the distance between Korea and the US on a journey to a mother country, Cha writes about this particular state of being, which is not solely fragmentary and dislocative, but also offers a plurality of experience. And now, now between at the outside from outside, in between the one actual to the another actual present. How many present, how many simultaneous alternate following daylight to the end of daylight. With these words, Cha reflects on a particular mode of being which opens up perceptions of now as time and place is stretched to a fluid dimension composed of a multitude of alternate and simultaneous present. The cinematic screen attests the dreamer's wish to be in two places at once the world towards another dimension, a salvific fictional space perhaps. The condition of exile is the epitome of this state, a border country where you inhabit two separate places simultaneously and are both one and the other, and thus because freed from disseminations, also yourself. A fictional timeless realm where the subject is unchained from impositions of time, race, language and identity. A particularly um, visual section within Dicte, the errata section, elucidates some of these ideas on identification and estrangement within the cinematic space. The passage revolves around the relationship, uh, the relationship between a woman who is watching a movie in a theater and the woman depicted in the movie who are seen in relation to the reader's understanding of the visual text. By presenting a cinematic screen and a cinematic scene, Chai immediately introduces ideas of cinematic identification. 
By doing this, she surely questions the passive way viewers are often carried away by the lure of the cinematic apparatus and its visual darkness of meaning. A critique of the illusion that the act of viewing is to make alteration of the visible, as she problematically puts it in a magnum opus. Christian Metz also highlights the dangers to a climb, lapse and fall of the spectator into the cinematic screen, when he points out in an essay published in a work edited by Cha herself that, the narrative film encourages narcissistic withdrawal and receptiveness to fantasy. Yet he also praises the cinematic apparatus for its potential to motivate the viewer to engage in acts of empathy. Remarkably, the narrative within the errata section shifts from she to you, thus prompting emotional and scenic identification. Through various incomplete identifications within the other, readers become part of the artistic and cinematic space where word and image, self and other interact. The art piece becomes a contact zone where mutual identification and estrangement take place as a disappearance within the other. Um. In a 1975 performance of Vogue Voix, Cha holds a rolled white banner and then ravels the writing on it. Her eyes and mouth are covered with a white head headband that reads, Wa a beugle. The French phrase literally translates to blind voice, yet it can also phonetically mean the blind sees. Cha can be seen wearing white clothes, thus becoming a pristine canvas or a page for a text which is carried over and written onto the banner she holds. During the performance, Cha becomes an extension of the white page accepting to be written over, silent yet the bearer of meaning and the conduit of, of communication, a vessel for the audience's collective self. Within this piece, the act of writing over does not equal the stifling of a particular voice in favor of another. Rather, it represents the potential to overcome restrictions and impositions of meaning, which can be found in hegemonic patterns of speech, written and visual language. Within a work, what sender and receiver thrive and conspire in the creation of meaning. The piece celebrates the power of embodied readers and viewers and the act of allowing the other to speak through you. Um, throughout Chad's artistic imaginary, thus, memory is rescued from its status of dead object, tightly restrained by the manacles of mechanical history. Her experimentation with the visual and written sign and the artistic creation of cinematic contact zones heralds the act of remembering her body through dismembering tyrannical modes of representation and fixed conceptions of self and identity. As a performance artist, Cha constantly sought to perform a dynamic exchange between individuals and the, uh, within the artistic and linguistic space. She viewed the artist as a medium who could enable a kind of metamorphosis between two states rendered possible thanks to the participants' contribution to the act of making art. This chorus of utterances of question and answer sound and echo permeates Char's imaginative artistic dimension, where multiple voices and images coexist and merge, immersing artists, artists and receptor in an ensemble of perspectives. The page and the screen become a contact zone between silence and utterance, subject and object, word and echo. So that was my conclusion. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, uh, Madalena, and also Sophie for your presentations. They're extremely interesting. And I think that there were a lot of very interesting uh, links also to the previous presenters from the other two days. So thank you very much. So I'd like to open this up now for questions for everybody. Um, as uh, Paul had mentioned earlier, there's gonna be two kinds of ways we can ask questions. You can either raise your hand and you can ask it directly, or you can put the questions into the discussion box. So I'd like to open it up. Does anybody have a question to kind of start our discussion here? Holly, is that a hand? 
Yes, um, it was, if I may. <laughs> um, so thank you so much to both of you um, for your fascinating papers. Um, and I had a quick question for Madalena about um, the piece called uh, Permutation, Permutations um, in 1976. Um, and you mentioned the fact that um, the viewers never told who the subject is. So there's this constant interplay between you and I, um, which you then went to uh, went on to discuss a bit more in relation to other works. Um, but I was just wondering whether the fact that the viewer um, was never told who the subject was in that case um, was um, immersive in the ways that you talked about with the other works in the sense of um, uh, strengthening the relationship between you and I or whether it was deliberately unimmersive in that particular work because um, it creates um, a, a more obvious distance perhaps between the two. Um, yeah, so I was just curious whether there was a particular distinction in terms of immersion there. Uh, I think that both perspectives could be acceptable, right? Because uh, I do think that um, your, your perspective is right as well in that, uh, there is a sort of distance that is created by not revealing the main subject's identity. And curiously enough, when you Google images of Theresa Hakun Cha and her memory is kind of um, dispersing now, she's not very well known. When you Google her name uh, into Google images, you will find that pictures from, you will find pictures from permutations. And so, photographs of Bernadette, not her, right? But in a way that says a lot about her work and that says a lot about what she thinks about uh, the way artists and audience communicate through within space and time. Um, but definitely there is, within that piece, permutations, there is an, uh, an anxiety around um, the fact that identity is always unstable, but also that is what allows immersivity and the the uh the process of empathizing with what are you looking at all right thank you very much um i have a question for sophie so it was about the last scene of the movie that you had put up there where you said there was a play on the words about the mer mer and it kind of made me think about the presentations yesterday. Unfortunately, I couldn't attend, um, but I know that water was very important. And I'm not familiar with Ackerman's film, but does that type of immersion and immersivity with water, is that like a light motif in her work that returns or is that mainly specific to that film? Um, that's a good question, Eric. Um, so I don't think there's, there's really a return to water per se. Um, I did sort of toy with the idea that maybe it was sort of like a sly reference to Les Quatre Sans Coups, where the last scene is, of course, that long travelling where Antoine de Wendel is running down the beach and he's sort of, he's running after la mer, but aussi la mer. Um, but no, I don't think water is really a recurrent theme in Ackerman's work. It, the mother is definitely a, th a theme that she returns to again and again and again. Um, I'd say there's probably... Yeah, she's probably more known for sort of these interactions with the mother and also with, you know, voiceovers as well. Um, yeah, she sort of makes these these voice cameos throughout her work. Um, and I think her mother, her mother's voice returns again and again throughout the work, both as a, an embodied voice and a disembodied voice. So, yeah, thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Bochel. Yeah, I uh, thank you both for your presentations. Uh, that's a follow up to this uh, question, actually, um, because uh, Manhattan as an island is can be seen like a womb, right? And this uh, this sea, and especially it's a very long shot. You say ten minutes, so it's like the birth, the, the, the like a birth canal. Maybe you know the birth of the of the of the director. 
Yeah, that's a, thank you. That's a fascinating observation. I, I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't thought of the, the island aspect of, of, you know, the setting of the film, but yeah, that's, that's great. I think it's also, that also kind of connects with the fact that um, the last 10 minutes of the film are completely silent. So the mother's voice is kind of gone. So I guess you could think of that as sort of the final rupture of this sort of maternal womb-like space where she's constantly being surrounded by the mother's words and the mother's presence. It's, yeah, I suppose exactly like the birth of the filmmaker. That's a lovely way of putting it. And the sounds could be the, the sounds that uh, the, the, the fetus hears in utero. I don't know, I've not seen the film either, so I, now I should. Um, but yeah, there's, yeah, there's definitely like a, a dreamlike quality to the voiceover mm -hmm. because it's sort of, it sort of um, sort of swims in and out of the diegetic sound, and it's yeah, it's sort of periodic, repetitive, and yeah. And it ties back to what you presented on the Cora, right? The the island uh, of Manhattan as a as a womb, and the and the Cora, which she can still hear the, the mother's voice. Mm, exactly. So I had a question uh, for Madalena. Um, so I noticed that throughout the presentation you were putting up, there was text um, from like different quotations. So unfortunately I'm not familiar with Cha's work at all. Um, but one thing that kind of shocked me is that it looked like there was a deliberate effort to kind of like perturb some stylistic um, conventions, like not using capitalization for certain words, especially with I, and I'm wondering does that tie in at all? Is there any like interlinguistic references? Because I know that you mentioned contact zones, which made me think of Mary Louise Pratt's um, work on transculture rural work. And I was wondering if that plays into her work at all with that. Uh, definitely another aspect of Cha's work I'm really interested in here is uh, experimentation with language and her sort of deep awareness of uh, the sort of uh, um, potential of language to sort of um, enhance or also hide meaning. So um, I think her use of black and white is, is really, um, really shows this. So um, within our video, she always uses black and white and that's always um, a sort of uh, reference to writing. And her whole over sort of displays um, an amalgamation of uh, words and images. So for her, words are very visual as well. And the image can be a written sign as well, can be interpreted as a written sign. Uh, and I'm really interested in her concept conception of uh, language of, as visual. And Cha herself spoke various languages. So she spoke a mother tongue Korean, and then she learned French and English. So she was deeply aware of the way that sort of playing around with language can play uh, help us play with sig signification as well and perhaps uh, elucidate meaning or hide meaning and um, also that really ties in with the background and the culture because uh, Cha's Cha's mother she grew up during Jap Japanese uh, Japanese colonization of Korea when Korean was forbidden. So Koreans were, were forbidden to speak their own mother tongue. And Cha was deeply aware because of this as well, of the, the links between language and identity. Hopefully that answered your question. Absolutely, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Are there any other questions from the audience? I had one very quick one. If nobody yes, else. please. <laughs> so I was thinking back to um, the Mère Mère scene again as well with um, Sophie's paper. And um, uh, I was thinking about it in relation to what uh, you were saying, Diana, about the representation of looking out um, at the ocean in real life or potentially in film versus um, hearing about it in a book where um, you're given a set of instructions on how to read to read it and view it um, and it uh, and therefore you kind of experience it very differently um, 
And I guess I was wondering whether in film and in Ackerman, this film of Ackerman's, um, in what way, um, what instructions are used in order to suck the viewer in, if you like, as um, you might be in a book? What kind of, um, so uh, we talked about sound as well. Uh, Michel Bachelot was talking about, uh, yeah, the bon sonneur. So what is it about the music or other cinematic devices that um, don't just reflect um, her trajectory as auteur and the relationship between mère and mère, but also kind of suck us in as readers? Thanks, Polly. That's a fantastic question. Um, I think there's also, I didn't really go into it, but I think there's a really quite an intense kind of emotive aspect to this film. Um, so I even toyed with the idea of um, News From Home being a sort of autobiography in the second person because Ackerman kind of addresses herself as you constantly through her mother's words. So I suppose as a viewer, it's almost like you're being directly addressed by the mother, which is, it's sometimes it's quite confronting, but sometimes it's sort of, it's humorous and it's sort of bittersweet. Um, yeah, the letters are kind of a passive aggressive and, you know, they're quite, quite direct. She's quite direct with, um, you know, with her emotions, with her feelings. Um, in a few interviews about the film, Ackerman talks about the fact that her mother was, um, a Polish um, refugee from the Holocaust. So the French that she wrote um, was naturally quite simple and she was quite direct with her words. So I think she, she's got this lovely quote where she says that her mother um, would, would, would tell her quite tell her things quite directly, whereas other mothers who have French as a first language would say the same thing, but by a thousand detours. Um, so I think there's definitely that aspect to it. It's, sometimes it feels like emotional manipulation on the part of the mother, but um, it's it's definitely quite it's quite intense anyway. <laughs> so I think that's part of the the immersivity is the fact that we're being addressed directly by this mother that we we never see. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Are there, yes, Professor Holmes. Yeah, no, just fo following following on from that. And it, it, what seems interesting as well, though I haven't seen the film either, Sophie, but um, is that th th there's a kind of immersion, but where the senses are divided because on the one hand, visually you're plunged into the reality of, of New York streets. And whilst um, emotionally and hourly, what you're hearing is, that, that is the mother's voice so is the the world that she's that she's left behind and um and yet that's i imagine quite quite powerful i mean it's quite possible to have the senses divided though both each of them equally power strongly immersed in a, in a different reality um, that seems to be the defining feature of the film and then possibly at the end from what you say with those 10 minutes of of where the mother's voice disappears at the end, there's a kind of coming together of the, the aural and the visual. Definitely, definitely, yeah. I, in my thesis, I sort of said that she's, she's kind of at a crossroads between like the old world of Europe and the new mm -hmm. world of um, America. Um, so yeah, she's definitely stuck between kind of the expectations of home, which I suppose, you know, marriage, having children, etc., mm -hmm. and kind of the opportunities that are before her in the US. Um, yeah, so I think definitely at the end, it's sort of, um, it's a coming together of, mm -hmm. you know, this soundtrack and, and the image track as well, which is quite powerful. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? All right, if not, I just really want to thank uh, both presenters today, um, both for your presentations and also for your response to the questions and for the discussion. That was uh, very, very thought provoking, very interesting. And I want to thank you both. And I also want to thank everybody who attended today to uh, support the symposium. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I guess we can give like a round of applause for the presenters. So thank you.
Many thanks to you again as well, Diana, for your keynote this morning. And all those of you who arrived at such early hours of the morning, um, especially Eric, who I think was up from 4 a.m. So <laughs> many thanks indeed. It was my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, have a lovely afternoon. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Have a good day. Thanks so much. And Adina. <laughs> Hello. Oh. I don't know if Adina's still with us. Maybe. Adina, are you still with us? Also, should I stop the recording now to avoid cutting later? Yep.